a beautiful sight to be in a room filled with great spiritual warriors. And I know that we are joined in many places now around the world by many other spiritual warriors and great souls, seekers of liberation, bodhisattvas. And beings who are aligned with the highest truth and whose hearts are open to the most beautiful, divine, unconditional love. And it is these qualities that will provide the healing that the world now needs. Not vaccines and other forms of chemical intervention, but the intervention of God consciousness into the world. Coming from all over the world, from all sides, of those who have clearly heard the clarion call of the events that are passing in the world that are a beautiful instrument of awakening. And so it is for us not to be concerned about the phenomenal plane level of how did this happen and why and what and, and uh, what might be various parties, particular roles in all of this. But what we must understand is what is the higher purpose of this event? And it is very clear from all of the signifiers that have been thrown at us from the collective, whether consciously or not, but as a simple unfoldment of this divine lila, that this is an event meant to bring about a global awakening of consciousness. And of fearlessness in the face of the apparent death that seems to be plaguing the planet as in a biblical time in the book of Exodus. But because there are no accidents, it is very clear that the name corona or crown is what is being given at this moment to those who are willing and able to take advantage of the situation that we are faced with. Because humans have lost the crown of light in our fall into body consciousness, ego consciousness, and have lost our connection to the supreme presence, the supreme power of life. And we are called, and many of us mandatorily forced to sit and meditate and return to that lost dimension of consciousness from which we have wandered into a world of sensory intensity, but have lost the intensity of the bliss of our real nature. And it is this real nature 
our deathless nature, our nature as luminous beings that we must now return to. The world is providing us with an opportunity to go inward, to reevaluate our lives and our purpose, and to come to understand once again who we are and what we are capable of. But to do that, we must be willing to let go of all that is false, all that is limited, all that is merely an appearance in the phenomenal world that is temporary, and discover again what is eternal, what is true, what is beautiful, in our own hearts and share that with all. That's the immunity that we must offer to the world. The immunity to maya, to illusion. So just before coming here, for some reason my hand reached into a bookshelf and pulled out the Guru Vachika Kovai, uh, purely by accident. <laughs> but I opened it at random to a page, and I thought, well, what would Ramana want, want me to say on his behalf uh, as we start the retreat? And my eye immediately went to, uh, well, it was on page 168 for those who have the book, but it's a section titled Bondage and Liberation. And the, the sentence that I read is, the wearing away and the annihilation of the sorrowful and illusory freedom of the jiva, which takes the body as I, is alone the attainment of the sorrow-free and authentic freedom of the self. And so those of you who are unhappy that your bodies may be locked down and unable to go to the beach or the pub or wherever you might want to go, uh, that illusory freedom uh, needs to be taken away so that you're willing to find the real freedom, the authentic freedom of the self that is bodiless and that cannot be confined to space or time. So I hope we will take advantage of this retreat to rediscover that sorrow-free, authentic freedom of the self and live as the self in that supreme awareness that supreme fearlessness and love and freedom from illusory thoughts and freedom from clinging, whether clinging to the organism that is one's vehicle or clinging to other people or clinging to things, to possessions, I would even suggest it's not wise to cling to money. It's not wise to cling to anything now but God and to realize God as the self. For most, this will take practice. If you haven't already been practicing for a long time, then the intensity of the practice should be very great and its continuity. If possible, it should be without interruption, regardless of whether the body is active or inactive. 
and even to practice going into sleep still in self-realization. And so this retreat will focus on encouraging and assisting in helping those reach the capacity for such practice that will bring about a breakthrough from the ego's level of thinking about reality to realizing that supreme reality that is beyond doubt. For those on live stream, we are accompanied by royal peacocks who <laughs> will also offer the vibrational frequency of freedom and uh, of uh, fearlessness and, and of uh, a belief in boundarylessness <laughs> <laughs> that uh, we must find a way to realize in a non-bodily fashion. So the retreat, if it's going to be of any help to anyone, must deliver truth to you. And my responsibility is to deliver that truth from a, a realization of its reality and to be able to articulate it in a way that you can digest it and assimilate it and realize you already knew it and now it's only a matter of taking it from the symbolic plane into the plane of immediate presence. So since we are dealing in truth, I have to first make a confession I'm not happy with the title of this retreat. Let me first write it. When the title first came, it was given in light of the awareness that what has occurred was soon going to happen and that it would indeed bring about a cascade of events that would bring about a death of a particular kind of social organization, not just in one nation, but planetary wide and that this would lead to a, a, a major and radical shift of the conditions of life for everyone. We are just entering into the beginning of that phase and it's important that we understand the entirety of that process that civilizations have lifespans, they also come to an end, and with death there is always rebirth. But nonetheless, as I thought about the title more, I realized that I was pandering to ignorance in a certain way, perhaps my own, but also the, the ignorance that is the collective consciousness that we are here to come out of. And so I would like to now give a more full title to this retreat that may represent different phases of realization that you will have to go through in order to be able to uh, grok the fullness of the significance of this event 
which is more than simply the uh, uh, the morbidity of a particular uh, social mode of uh, living and the uh, the beginning of a new one so First, I want to add a two. Uh, one has to awaken to the fact that we are in a, a world that is undergoing what is uh, conventionally to be seen as a death. Because if we don't come out of denial about that, then we will not be able to take advantage of the uh, the very powerful energies that are available to us now in order to help us transcend that apparent death. But it is an apparent death. And so I want to add also I want to add a from that we are awakening first to the seeming fact of a dying world, but then awakening from the illusion of a dying world. And first we have to recognize it's a fact, but secondly we have to recognize that it's only an illusion. Why? Because, in truth, there is no world. In truth, we are in consciousness. And consciousness never dies. And if we are in God consciousness, God consciousness neither rises nor sets. There is no beginning and no end. That ultimate presence is eternal, beyond time, beyond space, cannot be annihilated. It is Sat, and Sat is that very ancient word that means absolute being, being that is not in duality. It's not a being that alternates between existence and nothingness. It's the being that is absolute and is forever what we are. And it's within that vast space of consciousness, which the Buddhists would call the Dharma Dhatu or the Dharma Kaya, that this world with its particular attributes that are morphing now as a result of many factors of malfeasance of human egos uh, in the destruction of the natural environment and of the uh, economic uh, uh, environment through the corruption and through the uh, various machinations of power structures has brought about a situation like this, as well as everyone's collective uh, willingness to fall into very bad habits of living, which have made our immune systems much more prone to these kinds of attacks, and, uh, and have made us more fearful of, of getting sick and dying, so that we're willing to uh, to put up with such uh, uh, irrational means of trying to cope with the situation. But beyond all of that, the consciousness that we are must realize that the world is our dream. It's not an accident. We're not victims of some situation. 
whether human or natural, but a situation has arisen that forces us to return to a plateau of consciousness from which we have fallen, if not to the summit of the highest level of consciousness to which we are called. And so what we must awaken to is not simply the facts on the ground of the phenomenal illusory plane, but to the truth of the unlimited power of life that we have. And that we have that power once we have cleared away the impurities in our own mind and our own limitations through having fallen into a reality tunnel that is uh, very narrow-minded in terms of what we are capable of, once we return to that vastness of what we are, the power to redream the world will come with that. And so then there's a, a final level of uh, meaning In the last, at least for this retreat, understanding, we must awaken to the illusion of awakening to and from the illusion of a dying world. Because we also have to understand that we are not awakening because the real self, the only self, is always awakened. And so it's important not to identify with the ego that fell asleep, because that's what egos do. Uh, that's the meaning of having an ego, is that you have become one particle of the vast macrocosmic reality. By becoming particular, a particular person, rather than the whole of what we really are, and so when there is a recognition of that incredible consciousness of which the particular ego is only one small uh, atom, then we realize that even awakening is part of the dream. And so we are awakening from the dream of awakening, not just awakening in the dream as those who are awakening. It's that non-duality, that utter non-duality and changelessness and freedom from thought and therefore movement and from time and from attachment and identification that is always already present, even if we are in a more superficial level of our consciousness identified as the person, nonetheless, by simply paying attention to where this person derives its capacity for consciousness and awareness and intelligence from, we return instantly to that realization that we only dreamed we had fallen into a world and become an ego. But that never happened. And so it is this understanding that gives us the victory over circumstance, that gives us the capacity to thrive and to flower as the spiritual beings that we really are. We mustn't identify with an ego that feels either incapable or unready or unworthy or unchosen or 
uh, insufficiently intelligent or good or whatever to be able to have this uh, realization of God. But any such thoughts are part of the illusion. And so I hope that we will recognize that we don't know who we are if we think we are ego. And we see and realize the ego is simply a construct, a temporary expedient set of defense mechanisms in order to survive perhaps a dysfunctional family system or other situations that arose in life that created that need to, uh, to produce a self-image that was different from the self in order to uh, fit in and adapt to the circumstances of life that we are faced with out there in Kali Yuga, but that we always knew at some level that we were making it up, that we were creating a style and a form and a mode of thinking and reacting that we had either learned from outside, from films and novels and popular people and uh, other role models, positive and negative. And we had identified perhaps with those who we thought had the most power. And we adopted strategies of living in which we learned how to manipulate and how to try to dominate and how to try to uh, be invisible sometimes and be in the limelight and other times and do whatever was necessary to take care of the needs and desires and intentions of that ego construct. But we always knew it was just that. It was a, uh, a calling card, a presentation mask. It was a way of interfacing, literally, with the world of time and space. But what is the face behind that interface? What is the ultimate face, the face of God that one cannot meet without ego death? What is that ultimate being that we are, that we cannot know by looking in a mirror? And that we can only realize in silence in stillness, in the complete letting go of all concern for the seeming external world and completely giving our attention fully to the source of our consciousness, surrendering to the one self without any parts left outside of that innermost light and love and power that is our only salvation. And that is enough that frees us literally from all fear and weakness and dependency upon anything in the so-called external world. And once we have freed ourselves from the dependencies, then we have the luxury of realizing who is dreaming the dream of the world and not being stuck as a puppet, a character in this divine Leela but being one with the puppet master.
So this retreat is about that ultimate level of truth. But I know that people are at different levels and some are more concerned about the dying world. Some are much more happy about the fact that it's an illusion and others have let go even of that happiness because it's no different than anything that ever was. And the blissful self is always in bliss regardless of circumstances and is always beyond this illusion of birth and death. So how many uh, here can resonate with all of the levels of the full title of this retreat? Anyone? There's a few hands, okay. And to whatever level of the concept that one has uh, come to internalize or recognize as being uh, one's true nature and true uh, perspective, let's say, one's view of the real. Whatever that may be, it is nonetheless possible at any moment to realize that the one who is thinking in a certain paradigm or a certain world view, certain Weltanschauung, whatever it might be that is one's uh, frame of reference, one realizes that the self has the power to change that frame of reference. It's not a given, it's not written in stone, it is not uh, something that uh, cannot be seen beyond simply by recognizing that consciousness has a larger, much larger event horizon than the ego has. And that from an ego level, all one sees is a very tiny uh, perspective on a vast reality and cannot understand or judge uh, anything in its true nature. All the ego does is project and most of what it projects are its own uh, shadow self-images that it cannot bear to have within and so puts them outside of itself. And by collecting back all of that, we are able to be in the world without defensiveness or aggressiveness and to be in the world with compassion and with acceptance and love and peace. So I think I'll stop there and uh, open the floor to uh, questions from people in local space and in uh, cyberspace. Prusha. Thank you, Shunya. Um, I just wanted to say we're welcoming participants from all around the world to this retreat. We have people as close as the Diamante Valley down the road in Costa Rica and as far away as Australia and Malaysia and all around the world. We're wel welcoming many people with us whom we haven't seen in years, some we saw just a few weeks ago and some we've never seen. And we're happy to have you all with us and joining us for this inaugural event. We just have one question so far, um, which comes from Tahera in Switzerland, who says, I've studied ancient Indian scripts, some Buddhist as well as ancient Christian studies. I'm a practicing yogini and believe in, self, in spiritual self-experience. Um, and goes on to ask the question, oh, well, she says, now, it's also said that we initially come from that higher state, and our task is to return there. My question is, why on earth should I want to reach that state if I can fall out of it again and again? I would prefer some state that's more stable. 
I've asked many scholars, gurus, but I haven't got a satisfying answer from any of them so far. I very much appreciate your reply. We don't fall from the state of God consciousness. We dive. We jump out of the airplane without a parachute uh, because it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> you know, it's, and it's like that story of the guy who, who, who jumps from the top of the skyscraper and as he's going down the 15th floor, 10th, 9th, somebody calls out, how are you? So far, so good, you know. Well, okay, <laughs> we're, we're kind of in that. But the point is, uh, it was a choice. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, something that we were forced to do. We fell into ego consciousness because we wanted the intensity of sensory experience. We wanted to know existence uh, within the dream and all of the kinds of experiences that you can't have in God consciousness, like suffering. <laughs> and so uh, since uh, God has limitations because uh, God can't suffer and can't know what it is to have a gender, God is not male or female, and God is not able to, to uh, have uh, experiences of giving birth and of, uh, of dying and of fighting in wars and duels and all of those kinds of military enjoyments that some people are into, or other kinds of competitive activities, maybe like b basketball or uh, soccer or other games. Uh, or chess, uh, or whatever. People, uh, people, the consciousness enjoys being a people and being involved in all kinds of ways of using intelligence uh, for basically vain and futile purposes, uh, for the enjoyment of testing oneself within a, a playing field that isn't available in heaven. And so uh, it was a choice to come down, and it was a choice to go through all the permutations of consciousness from soul down to ego, and ego in its, uh, in its so let's say, most degraded form at the end, uh, in order to learn from all of those experiences and gain the wisdom that would enable us now to make the choice to get back in that, I won't say airplane, spaceship perhaps, uh, into, uh, into that supreme consciousness from which we came, and this time to uh, say, okay, I've had enough, and, and remain as that eternal light, rather than uh, blowing our own light out in order to know darkness. So it is, a, it is an experience that gives an awesome kind of beauty and revelation of the shadow side of life, the dark night of the soul, literally, and to know the beauty of the darkness as well as the infinite beauty of the light. And by doing that, we become whole. We become a true beings that contain the non-duality of day and night. Of, of time and eternity, life and death, of all the paradoxes that reality could provide. And we become the embodiment of that paradox. And it, it is that ultimate capacity to vibrate again with simultaneously the realization that you are nothingness, absolute nothingness, at the same time that you seem to exist as a being in a world with some kind of positive energy and the infinite oscillation at the speed of divine light breaks you through the illusion of the phenomenal plane and r makes you realize that we never fell at all. This was never anything but a, a hologram that is the divine light in drag but we have never left that supreme abode of, of 
ultimate absolute bliss and this is the way that we decided to enjoy that bliss and spend some of our eternity within the illusory realm of time uh, just because God can do anything God wants to do. <laughs> and now we want to bring the light and the peace and the love and the silence back once again to heal the world that we have created as an illusion to entertain ourself uh, in this beautiful tapestry that is the great work of art that God calls creation. I hope that's of some help, Tahera. Are there any questions here? Okay, go ahead. Okay, we've got another few questions coming. Uh, the first one is from Rolando, who just left a ah, day or two ago. Rolando. And I'm going to combine it with uh, Chris, who was just here as well, question, because they're, they're pretty similar. Rolando says, uh, greetings to my good friends. What can Shunya recommend to maintain higher levels of energy for us who are, quote unquote, outside? And Chris asks a similar question. He asks, what are the best ways to be of service externally during this time? Mm. The energy that we require is the energy of attention. We have to be able to hold the mind in stillness. Okay, this is the one practice that we must perfect. But you can only hold the mind in stillness if you're not, not identified with thoughts. And so you have to realize the self that is thought-free presence that is peaceful and blissful presence. By entering into that dimension of your consciousness, you gain the willpower to keep the attention energies very strong. And once you have a mind that is free of your own mental chatter, you are able to perceive reality as it is you're able to read it accurately and interpret it accurately. You can interpret your dreams and the dreams of others and the body language and the energy field and have a precognitive understanding of what is unfolding. So it is the energy of your intelligence that you want to expand. And it expands through holding the mind still that brings an infinite compression of the intelligence which breaks it through from the finite into the infinite. And then, because that infinite self is the source of all energy, whatever energies are needed, whether in the body or in the uh, capacity for articulation and emotional uh, resonance and compassion and empathy, or in the articulation of symbolic uh, understandings that can break through illusory paradigms, or in whatever way one needs to, uh, to act as an instrument of, of God's intelligence, will be given. And so the question that Chris asks of how to be of service is gain that energy. Go beyond the ego consciousness and you will be inspired as to how to help. But much of the help that we, uh, that we are called to give and that is needed is not physically going to people and uh, talking to them or, or trying to, uh, uh, to, to help them therapeutically in some way. It is simply emanating that energy of peace into the world, into the, the space. And by being an embodiment of that peace and strength and uh, truthfulness and love, we create a morphogenetic uh, energy wave that helps others to resonate at the same level of peace and of intelligence that will create networks of powerful um, interfaces 
of beings, even if they are not in the same space, that by their resonance, by their superorganismic unity, will be able to have a massive effect upon the unfoldment of the world drama. Even if you think you are powerless sitting in your house alone, but your consciousness is infinite and boundless and cannot be imprisoned. And it is that consciousness in its freedom that by merging with all the yogis who are resonating with that supreme level of presence will create the power to uh, bring the world into a new trajectory of evolutionary and revolutionary unfoldment to the highest possible outcome that will serve the, the souls of all beings and of all of nature and of the whole cosmos because we will be resonating in unity with the heart of the creation and therefore the service will be spontaneous and accurate. I hope that's of help, Chris. Is there anyone locally who wants to say? We have a question. Uh, thank you for your teaching, beautiful uh, opening. My question is about the beauty of darkness because um, it seems to me that one of the greatest challenges uh, that is happening uh, right now is, is to see the beauty of darkness, to understand that the unfoldment of the uh, apparent uh, tragic events, dramatic events that are happening at every level, and you, you mentioned uh, a few of those, uh, is, is terrible, is, is bad news, it's a, it's a curse, it's... Um, I mean, I could go on and on with different signifiers, but there is a beauty in all of this, um, can I say, um, almost dance. We talk about dance and choreography, if you wish, perhaps is a better word, because the, uh, the let's say, a continuation or, or unfoldment of events in the way that they're happening has a logic to it. And uh, how, how does one find the beauty in mm. this kind of choreography mm. that we're seeing every day, mm -hmm. ever okay. more. Thank you. It's an important question. I immediately, what comes to mind is the uh, video lecture we saw of Michael Tossig, the anthropologist, you remember, talking about the global meltdown and that this was a, a manifestation of what he called, I think, the infernal sublime or something of that nature. Uh, and this has actually been the essential beauty that modern artists and poets and, and novelists have been writing about since uh, the 19th century with Dostoevsky and Crime and Punishment and Baudelaire, The Flowers of Evil, and, uh, and then all of the anti-heroes uh, of, uh, of, of the uh, early uh, modern literature and the existentialist literature, Camus, The Plague, you know, and uh, all of that, uh, and of all of the uh, Hollywood films that glorify destruction and death and evil and uh, all of the various kinds of things that are unfolding since life does imitate art and, and art uh, precognitively sees how life is unfolding. So uh, the, this period of the end of, of uh, Kali Yuga has, has been about uh, the worship of the, of the demonic and, and of the, uh, the forces of death and destruction. Uh, we saw that in ba Bataille, Georges Bataille, who was uh, uh, one of those people in France who was connected to Lacan and, and Deleuze and, and all of those uh, philosophers, Derrida, Foucault, who wrote about biopolitics, the very kinds of situations we're in now were, were completely uh, predicted by Foucault, for example. Uh, these these uh, writers and, uh, and thinkers recognized that it was our, our love for the morbid, for death, for evil, for uh, the... Uh, 
the destruction of what has come to deserve to be destroyed is actually a kind of divine uh, cleansing or catharsis of the world. It's the end of the world as a prison. It's not, it's not the beginning. It's not something that is horrifying, except if you take a, a very narrow uh, view of it, because what it is doing, it, is, it has brought a world that was at the edge of chaos into complete chaos by literally stopping the economy in its tracks, stopping all the world processes that we have taken for granted. We now have the possibility of an opening to a, a new way of being that could be very dystopian if it's, uh, if it's uh, accepted passively on an ego level, but it can also be something uh, of extreme divine nature if that is the level of consciousness that we respond to this event from. And so everything will depend on our own capacity to respond. And that cannot be determined from above. Between stimulus and response, that we have absolute freedom. And we have to make use of that freedom. This is testing who we are. And if we can rise to the occasion and be courageous, and be free of all of the ego's pettiness, we can reach a level of consciousness in which we can turn this into the greatest blessing that the world has ever seen. So there's no reason to label it as horrible and a disaster and, and uh, all of those other terms. That's a very superficial look, and it's the way that they, in quotes, want people to feel. They want paranoia to be the dominant reaction because then uh, they can control. Because if you're paranoid, then you want Big Brother to protect you, to vaccinate you, to uh, right, take over control of your life, to keep you safe in you know, your little bubble. But if you're fearless and you can understand reality and take your place uh, as one who is able to manifest destiny, not to be a victim of the intentions of others who would want to, uh, to uh, control your fate, then the power of consciousness will break through all of the limitations that seem to be happening right now. And uh, your immune system will be strong to protect you on that level, but your intelligence will protect you on other levels and your capacity to transcend the ego will enable you to form into clusters and communities of beings who will be able to bring about uh, a new kind of a network of meaning and purpose and consciousness that will, because of its greater coherence, override what is now the general level of discourse and communication and bring about a, a new order that's based on goodness, on love, on intelligence, on the capacity to, uh, to work for the good of the whole from a non-egoic position and to be able to redesign the world's uh, optimal organization so that nature can again flourish and all beings can be happy and be free and be fulfilled. And so that is what we now have the opportunity to manifest. So to me, this is the greatest uh, opening and uh, opportunity for uh, liberation, both within the phenomenal and, and through transcendence of the phenomenal. Okay, thank you. Okay. We have a question from Alyssa, who's in New York City. She says, I have a deep fear of the other and the judgment of others who want to understand and, and want to understand how to release this. The ego is constantly hiding my truth out of fear. Is presence the only answer? Well, you might want to begin by tracing back the fear. Perhaps it came from childhood traumas. 
but if you realize who you are and you realize that uh, you base yourself on what is real, not on what is simply, let's say, a cardboard self-image that someone can like or dislike or, uh, or reject or ridicule or abandon or whatever the fear of the other uh, takes its form as, uh, if you realize that you are not at the mercy of the other's approval or disapproval, you will be able to stand your ground in that groundless ground of pure presence that uh, emanates light and love. And if others don't want what you're emanating, then okay, so be it, but you lose nothing. The sun doesn't lose anything if uh, the tree doesn't want to accept the sunlight. The tree will die, but the sun will not be bothered by it. So you don't see trees refusing sunlight. Uh, but uh, in the same way, uh, if you are shining with that truth, then those who are, are not open to that light and, and that goodness will leave uh, your space and then you, you won't be bothered by them. But there's no reason to be fearful. And if you are fearful, you tend to then create and project and, and have come back to you what you're afraid of. So fear is a very bad strategy. It doesn't protect you. There are a lot of people who think being afraid protects them. And uh, it's, it's not actually the case. So the more that one can be fearless and know that you can deal with whatever you have to face, uh, you will get through it with the uh, internal support of that in you which is unconditional and unfailing. And you have to take the risk at first of uh, presenting yourself in the naked awareness of what you are, not what you're trying to be for the other, and then see the difference in the kind of response you get when you are fearlessly present without any uh, uh, concern for the feedback you might get from outside. Is there anyone? We're getting toward last call time. Okay, Josie. I appreciate the basketball comment. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've heard a lot of people, including my own ego, say, you know, I'm trying, but I'm trying to meditate. I'm trying to stay focused. I'm trying to give my attention to this higher self. Um, but obviously when you try, you fail because trying is on an ego level. Um, so I guess my question is, how can you still keep that will, the four-wheel drive, but not try? Like how do you distinguish will with effort? <clears throat> trying comes from the assumption that you already know who you are, who's going to try. But the I that is going to try is, in fact, the wrong I. Okay? So when you see the mind saying, I'm going to try to meditate, I'm going to try to do this or that, then immediately detach from it and, and ask, who am I? I'm not that. That's a construct that was created to make other people happy, right? I don't need to try anything. So yes, yeah, stop trying, but also stop being the I that was uh, attempting to get what it needed by trying. And then realize that the I that you really are has no desire and no fear and is already that, doesn't have to try to be, uh, and then just enjoy. And then you'll find just by abiding in the, the silence and the peace of being who you already are, more power will come, will emanate, more ideas, inspirations, more uh, of a sense of the, uh, the, the true nature of all that is will become visible and, and clear. Your mind will become sattvic. It will become free of all the mental chatter that produces distortions in your perception. And the ego will gradually fall away and you will uh, be revealed to yourself 
as that supreme presence that is eternal. So just be, don't try. Okay? Thank you.